Okay, we'll make a start. Um, welcome, everybody, um, to this event, uh, which is co-hosted by the Pears Institute for the Study of Antisemitism and the Birkbeck Institute for the Humanities. Um, my name's Anthony Bale. I teach English here at Birkbeck and, and study um, Jewish-Christian relations, and I'll be chairing the event this evening. Our title tonight is Proust Among the Nations, From Dreyfus to the Middle East. Um, and this reflects the title of Jacqueline Rose's new book, published recently by the University of Chicago Press. And Jacqueline Rose's book is both, and it is and is not um, a book about Proust. It takes Proust as its starting point and ranges over a huge amount of material, exploring how Proust and Dreyfus, two Frenchmen and two French Jews in some eyes, um, from the late 19th century, help us think about the history and the present day of Israel and Palestine. We're joined by Professor Rose and also by three distinguished speakers who will speak in the order in which I introduce them. Um, <laughs> so um, first we have Ingrid Wassena, a writer, commentator and consultant and the author of Proustian Passions, uh, which is a major reassessment of Proust which appeared um, in the year 2000. And then we have Brian Chayette at the end um, who's Professor of English at the University of Reading and has written several key texts on British Jewish literature of the 20th century and on Holocaust literature. Then we have David Feldman, who's the Director of the Pears Institute and Professor of History here at Birkbeck, and he's published widely on both Jewry and migration in 19th and early 20th century Britain and Europe. And then we'll have some comments from, from Professor Rose, Professor of English at Queen Mary, Jacqueline Rose is a prominent commentator on both modern literature and the situation in Israel-Palestine, and she works at the interface of politics, psychoanalysis, history, and literary criticism. So I think there'll be something for everybody in tonight's <laughs> session. Um, the book we're discussing this evening follows two other books um, by Professor Rose on the Middle East, The Last Resistance, which came out in 2007, and The Question of Zion, which appeared in 2005. So each of the speakers has 12 minutes, which I'll be timing assiduously. Um, and then there'll be the opportunity for questions and observations and discussion, not only about the book, but also about the broader issues which our contributors have raised. So, so Ingrid, first you. of all, I'm very honoured to be invited to speak uh, and to talk about Jacqueline's book. Um, I've known her for many years, and I've always been in awe of her knowledge and her brilliant readings. Um, and above all, the incredible care and attention that she pays to everything that she considers. Um, I've never known a thinker who was quite so fierce and passionate about what she writes about, but who is also so gentle and warm in her interpersonal dealings. So Jacqueline is one of a handful of people that I've been lucky enough to meet um, who are able to give their attention freely to anything in their purview, completely unconditionally, and yet somehow also with the most rigorous and stringent of conditions attached. Uh, to me, I can see this again in Proust Among the Nations. I think that Jacqueline's thesis is also her approach, which is that since Proust, or since Dreyfus, or maybe in complicated ways since both of them, we have no choice but to become moral strugglers. We're always in the middle of things. Nothing is ever completely settled. So Proust, the epitome of the modernist sensibility, poised between two centuries, observer of the convulsions that transition produced, orders us, according to Jacqueline, relentlessly to think again and again about the positions that we espouse, our certainties and our desires. He knows his own potential for violence, she puts it on page 23. So I thought I would stand up and say that Proust is an anti-Semite. One of the conversations that we have had, going back to 1998, is whether the whole of A La Recherche is just an exercise in self-justification. That's what my work's been about. Did he do the whole thing just to make himself feel better? How do you account for this enormous novel, which is a venture that no one would publish today? Why is it so hard to tell whether Proust was a snob or not? Was he gay or not? Was he Jewish or Catholic or somehow both? 
Has he written a novel or a kind of blog? In other words, is it autobiography or fiction? So Proust was an anti-Semite. Let me explain. This is what came to me as I was preparing on Sunday for my son's sixth birthday party. I was wondering how I could reconcile blowing up balloons and worrying about vegetarian sausages for the invitee sibling with writing about Palestine. And I decided that I need not fear because Proust learnt everything that he needed to know, or quite a lot of it, from parties. <laughs> Proust's narrator, Marcel, spends much of his temps perdu at parties. That's quite a lot of what he does in the novel. These are parties full of ar aristocrats, arrivistes, parties held while the, the Trefus affair is raging, when Paris talks of nothing else. Circulating at parties, the narrator cannot but hear about the affair. And nowhere in the novel are the parties as fraught as they are in the central volume in Sodom et Gomorrah. And this is the amazing transitional volume in A la Recherche, in which the narrator <laughs> discovers male and female homosexuality. So we find ourselves at the Princesse de Guermantes, circulating at a soiree that will mark the apogee of the narrator's contact with the Faubourg Saint-Germain. This is the one he's wanted to get into. He's not quite sure he's been invited. He turns up, he's let in, so he carries on. Critics tend to think of Proustian parties as either an erotics of social signification, that's Adorno, or as an anthropological invest investigation of ritual, am I invited, that's Degom. But I feel, and I think that I think that Jacqueline's thinking takes off from a similar point of view, that one way of looking at Proust's parties is as a highly fraught terrain for identity politics. Identifying your position in Sodom et Gomorrah is absolutely crucial. Are you gay or straight? Are you male or female? Are you loyal or treacherous to me? That's the Albertine story. Are you Jewish or Israelite? Are you Trefusard or anti-Trefusard? Are you aristocrat, haute bourgeois, or ouvrier? I cannot tell just by looking, but I might from what you say. This anxiety about giving one's position away is not a surprise necessarily. You have to remember that the Third Republic really came to life in bloodily suppressing the 1871 Commune, and the whole of Proust's life was played out against scandal, conflict, extraordinary social mobility, and ultimately world war. Proust was born, if you remember, only two months after the suppression of the Commune, just two months. Thousands of people were murdered during the Commune. The Panama scandal in 1892 tore France apart. Hannah Arendt has argued that the implication of two Jewish bankers of German origin, Reinach and Hertz, paved the way for the Dreyfus Affair, which then exploded only two years later, 1894. There's also the arguments surrounding the separation of church and state, which gave rise to laïcité. We owe the Affaire du Voile in the late 1980s to the arguments that were going on in 1905, separating church and state. Proust had an opinion about that. He wrote about this. Proust started to conceive the novel that would become A la Recherche in 1908, so two years after the full rehabilitation of Trefus, and around the same time that the major homosexuality case, the Affaire Eulenbourg, caused a massive scandal in France and Germany. So position was everything, because everyone stood to lose their footing. Back to the Princesse de Guermantes. At the party, we are made to wait through interminable digressions. During these digressions, the narrator listens very attentively. In fact, he spends all his time at parties listening to conversation and reporting it. In, at this party, we hear the most offensive remarks being made by the Baron de Charlus, um, his impunity born of his rank, but also his own madness. Once we've managed to ease Charlus off stage, we're waiting, although we don't yet know it, for the death of Charles Swann. Not his deathbed scene, but his death as a participating character in the novel. 
Charles Swann, you remember, is the hero of the third person part of A la Recherche, that story about jealousy, obsessive jealousy, which ends in his marriage to the woman he was jealous of, Odette. Swann, all these years later, is now dying, but he comes nevertheless to the princess's soirée. The narrator peers at his ravaged face. Sa figure se marquait de petits points bleus de Prusse qui avaient l'air de ne pas appartenir au monde vivant et dégageait ce genre de odeur qui, au lycée, après les expériences, rend si désagréable de rester dans une classe de science. His face was marked with little dots of Prussian blue, which didn't seem to belong to the living world and which gave off a kind of smell which at school, after experiments, makes it so disagreeable to stay in a science class. That's the narrator appraising his one-time visitor to his parental home, how things have changed. Swan's dying words are thus framed within the narrator's gleeful specular revulsion at the ravages of his illness. He's covered in spots of Prussian blue, Swan's body, elsewhere in the novel, is an unexpected observatory for Jewish assimilation. There's a lot of talk about his nose. And here he has been well and truly colonized by France's old European enemy. Swan's last speech takes the form of a confession. He confesses to the narrator, ce serait bien agaçant de mourir avant la fin de l'affaire Dreyfus. It would be so annoying to die before the end of the affair. But he is not just confessing himself. He's desperate to tell the narrator something that the Prince de Guermantes has just told him. He's thus confessing a confession, and he does so using direct speech. Now, this is, you're going to have to bear with me. This is a rather difficult quotation to give you, but on, on my sheet, there are four sets of quotation marks. Non, me répondit l'abbé. Je vous dis me, me dit Swan, parce que c'est le prince qui me parle. Vous comprenez? So I don't know if you could hear how many layers of people were speaking in that, but Swan is reporting the Prince de Guermantes reporting the Abbé Poiré's speech. And this is all part of his confession. It's almost impossible to render it on the page. The narrator tells the story in which he acts out the voices of the Prince de Guermantes and the Abbé Poiré. The Prince de Guermantes, the host of this party, wants the Abbé to say a mass for Dreyfus because the Prince has become convinced of Dreyfus's innocence. The Abbé refuses, saying that he has already done this. The Prince realizes that someone else in his circle must be a Dreyfusar, and the Abbé reveals that it is his own wife. Swan's excitement is palpable in the confusion of voices. He hasn't got much time left. Everything has to come out at once. And the narrator listens carefully to the compacted chain of discoveries. Swan finishes triumphantly, telling the narrator, but well, si vous saviez d'où il a fallu qu'il revienne pour en, arri en arriver là, vous auriez de l'admiration pour lui. D'ailleurs, son opinion ne m'étonne pas. C'est une nature si droite. If you knew where he's come from to get to this point, you'd admire him. Besides, his opinion doesn't surprise me. He has such an upright character. So Swan, overtaken by his illness, his face disfigured, full of regrets and sadness over love and jealousy and wasted time and books unwritten, energized only by the hope of seeing Dreyfus exonerated, stands there, open and vulnerable before us. One might expect compassion, but the narrator does not give an inch. Swan oublié que dans l'après-midi, il m'avait dit au contraire que les opinions en cette affaire Dreyfus étaient commandées par l'atavisme. Tout au plus avait-il fait exception pour l'intelligence. So Swan is not to have his pathetic triumph, the meager victory of knowing that one more nationalistic patriotic aristocrat has converted to Dreyfusism before he dies. The narrator, even at this moment, is still prepared to criticize Swan, to point out that he's contradicting himself, putting down to droiture de coeur what he had only recently himself attributed to intelligence. He won't let Swan off the hook 
of a kind of Kantian rigor. Swan himself had airily quipped to the narrator that people just revert to ancestral type when it comes to being for or against Dreyfus, so he can't praise the prince now. And not content with mocking Swan for his vacillating self-justification, the narrator goes on to lampoon us all. Ce qui pense comme nous, c'est que l'intelligence, si leur nature morale est trop basse pour être invoquée, ou leur droiture, si leur pénétration est faible, les y a contraint. That's quite, I find that quite a hard sentence to understand in, even in reading it. But basically, either if we think that people believe like us, think like us, it's either because they're very intelligent, if they've got a morally weak character, or because they're such morally strong people, if they're a bit stupid. So we will always, he says, caught in a play of narcissism, either attribute intelligence or moral probity to those who agree with us. Just to conclude, Jacqueline makes the point early on in her book that it takes a particular kind of mental promiscuity to entertain all the psychic options, to be willing to enter so fully the enemy's mental space. And it's in this sense that I say that Proust was an anti-Semite. What is at stake in this murderous encounter between the narrator of his novel and Swan? It's virtually impossible to know for certain. But what we are left with is the vertiginous occupation of all possible identity positions by the narrator, his desperate patrolling, but also his disruption of all reasoning. You have to hold your nerve to read this continual partitioning and resettlement at the very heart of the Proustian project. But holding your nerve is exactly what Jacqueline's work emboldens us to do. Thank you. I want to begin by saying how glad I am to be here and to have this opportunity to, to discuss Proust among the nations with such a distinguished panel and to be in conversation with Jacqueline about her work. Not that I haven't been in conversation before now, but just not with anyone else. <laughs> as, as, as someone who was appointed by Jacqueline at Queen Mary, and, and I have to say rescued from oblivion for writing on the kind of subject that seems to still preoccupy both of us, uh, there is always the danger that I'll spend my 10 or 12 minutes agreeing with Jacqueline, who was, after all, not just my colleague, but also my teacher. Uh, this is always difficult for a former student, especially an autodidact such as myself. <laughs> but Jacqueline is first and foremost an intellectual, and here I distinguish between an academic and an intellectual. And it's ironic, of course, that the term, the, the intellectuals, originated as a term of abuse in 1898 and is still used today dismissively, bl bloody intellectuals, remote in your ivory tower, etc., to impuse, impugn those who, like Zola and Bernard Lazar, supposedly spoke for universal rather than French values. As Ross Posnock has argued, when we recover the term intellectual, we also recover a history of cosmopolitan universalism. And it's this history in part which Proust Among the Nations engages with. Some of its best pages are on the fight to reclaim the term intellectual as a badge of honor for the whole of France, and in doing so to associate the world of literature with justice. As an intellectual of, what, of whatever variety, a cosmopolitan, Jewish, or feminist, or, or more accurately, a mixture of all three, dull agreement is anathema. And anyway, there's been far too much genuflection in London in recent weeks which is clearly best not to add to here. So the first half of my remarks will indicate the many points of agreement that I have with Jacqueline's book, and then I'll move on to prompt our conversation in a spirit of intellectual questioning. This book strikes me as perhaps Jacqueline's most Arendtian project, certainly since the question of Zion and perhaps even including it. A book that could be said, as she acknowledges, to have been written as a response to those sections in Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism, where Arendt reads Proust in the light of Dreyfus, and to Arendt's own discovery and canonization of the first Dreyfusard, Bernard Lazar. 
one way of thinking of Jacqueline is as a worthy successor to Hannah Arendt and at least part of a wider Arantian project, which, for want of a better term, I will call New Comparative Literary Studies after Spivak. Now, don't get me wrong. Hannah Arendt and Jacqueline Rose have a great many differences as well as similarities beyond Arendt's personal history as a refugee. The first of these differences is most obviously the figure of Freud, who sustains Jacqueline in this and all of her work and is largely ignored by Arendt. There is only one forced reference to Freud in uh, Elizabeth Young Broyles' definitive biography after Arendt wins the 1967 Sigmund Freud Prize in the German Academy. And this reference runs as follows, quote, for sympathy to toward the work of Freud, Hannah Arendt would certainly never have won a prize. Amazingly enough, in Arendt's monumental last work, The Life of the Mind, there isn't a single reference to Freud which takes some doing. In stark contrast, just read Proust Among the Nations, which at times could be retitled The Life of the Mind, where Freud is indispensable. To put it crudely, whereas Proust Among the Nations begins with what is called, quote, the darkest corridors of the mind, or the darker, more recalcitrant side of the mind, and makes the connection with some of our more recalcitrant histories, not least Israel-Palestine, Arendt begins with our dark times, as she calls them. So I'm making a contrast here between the darkest corridors of the mind and dark times. And Arant moves back into literature and the imagination to illuminate these dark times. Without Freud, Arant tends to stress literary qualities, qualities which saturate her work, such as spontaneity and the imagination to characterize the, huma the, the human, human qualities. In doing so, both figures stress the importance of literature. Ja Jacqueline asks right from the start, what can literature do to help us urgently with what she calls a new vocabulary or new way of thinking? And this idea of a new vocabulary or a new way of thinking, I think, was also very much at the heart of Hannah Arendt's project. It's literature that helps with this pressing task of thinking differently and here I couldn't agree more. It's precisely this kind of unclassifiable work, as we've heard from Anthony, somewhere between literature, history, philosophy or psychoanalysis and politics, that interests me the most. Now, where I find Proust Among the Nations more troubling, uh, which I'll try to articulate, and I hope uh, the conversation afterwards will, will help me even more in this task, is when it pulls unintentionally, I think, but here I might be wrong, in two different directions at once. As I say, this might be a misreading on my part, um, and we'll hear soon enough. Jacqueline might well have, uh, 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 be able just to tell us this tension was quite deliberate on her part. The problem with me starts with the word ethics. Now, I know it's more usual, usual that the word ethics is usually the end, of our problems, not the beginning. And this word is dotted throughout the book and usually takes the form of an extraterritorial justice. But it seems to me that the word ethics is doing two different kinds of work. On the one hand, we have what is called political ethics, which the reader is told we might do well to revive today. And on the other hand, we have what I shall call uh, ethical uncertainty, the ethical uncertainty of Proust, which we've just heard, heard a version of from Ingrid, whereas Jacqueline argues Proust offers, a, offers us an unsettled world with every public event pointedly undeciphered, with perhaps the exception of the injustice of Dreyfus. Now, what brings together political ethics and the ethics of uncertainty is precisely, in Jacqueline's felicitous phrase, the complex exchange of life and writing. Hence the focus on literature as a form of ethics in relation to injustice. 
imagining differently ac across nations and boundaries. At its starkest, uh, Genet's or Beckett's sense of absolute distrust in language in the face of the horrors of the 20th century, which they both witnessed, shows powerfully the tension between what I think of, at least, as these differing eth ethical positions. One on the side of certainty, one on the side of uncertainty. Or maybe that's the point. Maybe it's the phrase... Uh, which Jacqueline uses, which we might do well to revive today, which characterises Jacqueline's political ethics. Maybe that phrase is the real problem. Jacqueline, I think, uh, in many places in the book, and maybe this is the point of the book, unshackles the Dreyfus affair from history. Quite often, sometimes implicitly, sometimes explicitly, there is a direct call to the reader in the name of a political ethics. This can be seen, for instance, when Bernard Lazar is evoked as the only Jew to publicly criticise the leadership of French Jewry for refusing to speak out in favour of Dreyfus. As Jacqueline argues, the question to ask, perhaps in the spirit of Pesach, as if we were there also, is, quote, what could have been done? What could I have done? But I'm not sure if these are the right questions, or to put it another way, whether these questions assume rather more than they're letting on. Here the influence of Arant is not always helpful. If, like her, we believe that Dreyfus prefigures Vichy, then we will react in one way. If, like Lazar, we argue that assimilated wealthy Jews, what Arant calls parvenus, are very much part of the problem when it co comes to the rise of anti-Semitism, by not actively opposing it as if they were defined by their utter passivity, then we will react in another way. Here, Lazar, who broke with Herzl, becomes a conscious pariah, as he put it, in defending Dreyfus, and is championed in the name of an extraterritorial extra justice to lead us in another direction. But it was these political certainties that got Arant into most trouble by applying the parvenu pariah distinction to black segregation in the United States and also to the Jewish councils in relation to Eichmann. Such are the dangers, I think, as well as the benefits in reading back history from our contemporary vantage point, not least when politics and ethics become indistinguishable. What Proust Among the Nations does at its best, I believe, is bring the uncertainties of literature or the mind or the imagination to the most clear cut of cases, to those who argued for the innocence of Dreyfus. And what I think I'm saying is that, is that I would have liked more uncertainty, not less, in the book. What am I doing for time? One minute. I've got one page. Now, this is a real problem. My pages are two and a half minutes. Okay. Um, <laughs> um, okay. I think one problem here is, um, in, in relation to trying to get more uncertainty, is the question of, of uniqueness. And Jacqueline, in the book, talks about Israel-Palestine and talks about Israel specifically as un it's uniquely hard for Israel as a nation to see itself as the agent of violence of its own history. And this idea of uniqueness troubles me. It, uni it troubles me on all sides, of course. Um, all sides of the divide, if you like. When we talk about uniqueness, it seems to me that it's even more difficult to make an ethical politics uncertain if that's what we want. So let me just end. Let me just say, first of all, that none of these thoughts would have been possible without this wonderful book. Um, I just want to offer just one or two stories, one or two histories that point in slightly different directions. And here I think the figure of Amir Mufti in the book is quite interesting because he's kind of evoked and then he's withdrawn and he's actually withdrawn in the name of Proust. 
Um, and it seems to me what Mufti does is he talks about petition again after Arant. This is very much an Arantian project as well, where he looks at petition in the Middle East, he looks at petition in the Southeast Asia. And he doesn't make any distinguishes between the two. If you like, I mean, this is using a risky word from Arant, he banalizes these histories. None are unique. One flows into the other. Um, so examples of this uh, would be something like Salman Rushdie's 2005 novel, Shalimar the Clown, which precisely imagines the partitioned histories of Alsace and Kashmir in relation to the partition of Jewish history in Europe and Muslim history in Southeast Asia, as if Rushdie had written an imaginative version of Armin Mufti's book. Uh, but this also speaks to the importance of Alsace in Proust Among the Nations, and Jacqueline does some, some wonderful things around Alsace. But it's also, as I said, curtails, I think, Mufti's parallel histories. Or another example, Franz Fanon being accused of being an Israeli spy in Algeria as a black cosmopolitan intellectual, who had, of course, fought for the free French against the Nazis which again speaks both to the history of the Dreyfus affair, all spies are Jews, and the crucial parts of Proust Among the Nations, which shows us the importance of Algeria and the colonies as prefiguring the worst excesses of the treatment and response to Dreyfus by the military. And finally, uh, and this now follows Ingrid directly, why not read the Jewish stereotypes in Zola's fiction? Uh, those in Proust uh, are acknowledged by Jacqueline, and Ingrid has just spoken provocatively about Proust as an anti-Semite. But if you read Zola's fiction, this great fighter against anti-Semitism, uh, uh, in relation to these Jewish stereotypes, then at least I think there's a kind of problematization and banalization of the certainties of writing as political ethics as, uh, uh, in relation to Zola as hero. Now, none of these thoughts, just to reiterate, would have, occur would, would have occurred to me without Jacqueline's wonderfully provocative and challenging book. And for this, I could not be more grateful. Thank you. I'd like to start by um, thanking Jacqueline for inviting me to be here today, because it was when we were um, thinking about who could fill the third slot um, on the panel that Jacqueline persuaded me that I might, uh, I might do it. And I'm very grateful uh, for that because it has, uh, be, be, because reading A Proust Among the Nations um, has made me think hard in, uh, in ways that few other books have done in recent times. Um, but I think the sort of slightly clod-hopping elements to what follows comes from the brief for the th sort of third um, speaker here, which is a historian. So the historian will tread heavily where the literary scholars have skipped. Um, <laughs> Proust Among the Nations traces an arc that travels, as Jacqueline Rose tells us, from the heart of Dreyfus to Palestine, where the legacy of that dreadful saga is still being played out uh, to this day. But to state this um, so boldly, it does nothing to acknowledge the book's thematic and analytic density as it deals in ways that are luminous and unsettling with, for example, the politics of writing, the work of memory and memorialization, the dynamics of prejudice in the mind and in the world. Nevertheless, in the next minutes, I want to attend uh, to this arc, because in doing so, I want to explore the relationship that Jacqueline takes in the book, both to the politics of the past and of the present. How then does Proust among the nations travel? How does it make its journey from France to Palestine and the state of Israel? It does so, I think, in two main ways. First, in setting out a particular narrative, and second, 
by its focus on the concepts and, its, and the practices of partition. The narrative has something in common with Hannah Arendt's analysis of the Dreyfus affair, which Brian already has spoken about. In The Origins of Totalitarianism, Arendt tells us Dreyfus offers a foregleam of the 20th century. Certainly it was not in France that the true sequel to the affair was to be found, but the reason why France felt an easy prey to Nazi aggression is not far to seek. Hitler's propaganda spoke a language quite familiar and never forgotten. Proust Among the Nations suggests a similar premonition. Its acknowledgement that ultimately the Dreyfus affair was a defeat for anti-Semitism is swiftly followed and partially negated by a leap forward of 34 years to Vichy, to the Jewish laws passed on the 3rd of October 1940, and the internment of Jewish deputies and officials at Drancy before their de deportation to Auschwitz. The story, Jacqueline writes, because of Dreyfus, so Israel is not without some truth. That's the quotation. And so from Dreyfus and Vichy's complicity in the Nazi campaign of extermination, the argument is carried to the Middle East. It's carried in that phrase because of Dreyfus, so Israel. It will not be news to you when I point out that the line that runs from Dreyfus to Israel is one that was first drawn by Theodore Herzl, the founder of political Zionism. And it is certainly not news to Jacqueline, who makes this point herself precisely. For Herzl and others, Dreyfus signaled the futility of Jewish emancipation, of the idea that Jews could live a normal life without a national home of their own. Life in the, in the diaspora for Jews, they proclaimed, was impossible. The Nazi extermination campaign thus appears to confirm the Zionists' prescience in the most dreadful and literal way. As I read it, Proust among the nations hesitates at this point and does not wholeheartedly endorse this view. But neither does it subject it to critique. But from the point of view of the book's structure, Proust Among the Nations is deeply indebted to an account of life in the diaspora drawn not only from Arendt, but also from political Zionism. And in view of the way that vicious attacks on Jacqueline have been made for her writing on Zionism and Israel, it is impossible not to notice that this indebtedness to Zionism carries a heavy irony. But the point I want to make is that the Zionist analysis of Jewish life in the diaspora, not least in the, third, in the French Third Republic, is reproduced here. The problem with Zionism, as Jacqueline presents it in this book, is not with its understanding of life in the diaspora, least of all life in the Third Republic, but that Israel has learned the wrong lesson from Dreyfus. It has chosen ethnic exclusivity and the desire to be strong and no longer a victim and has paid too little heed uh, to Bernard Lazar's and Leon Blum's shared understanding of Judaism as fidelity to justice. This connection from France at the end of the 19th century to Palestine in the present and the state of Israel as it has taken shape since 1948 is essential to the argument of the book because it is in Palestine, we are told, that the legacy of the Dreyfus affair is being played out to this day. The present is the legatee of the affair, however, not simply in the sense that Dreyfus uh, 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 foreshadowed uh, the Holocaust and the Holocaust preceded the creation of the State of Israel, but also, as the book argues in a more profound sense, um, it's, uh, it's connected through the book's extended and hugely rewarding analysis of the work of partition explored through Freud and Proust, partition in the mind, in the nation, and on the ground. Minds like nations divide, Jacqueline tells us. Partition illumines the anti-Dreyfusards who wanted to expel the Jews as an unwanted foreign body from France to send them packing back 
to Jerusalem. But partition is also brought to bear upon the state of Israel's founding moment, one that also sought to solve the Jewish question through a process of partition and expulsion, the Nakba. This is finally then a story and an analysis of what Europe has done to the Jews and through them what it has done to the Palestinians. The final words tell us the accountability of the West towards the Palestinian people has barely begun. At this point, I want to return to the account of the Dreyfus Affair and to suggest a different interpretation of its significance, one that offers the possibility of a viable Jewish diaspora and, one, and also to, to suggest that this history might also connect with the politics of Israel and Palestine today. In fact, there is a trace of this alternative interpretation of the Third Republic in Arendt's account of the advent of Vichy. The Third Republic fell, she writes, because there were no more true Dreyfusars, no one who believed that democracy and freedom, equality and justice could any longer be defended or realized under the Republic. In this thought of Arendt's, the Dreyfus Affair is not a dress rehearsal for a fascist politics and the Nazi campaign of extermination, but rather it is a struggle over the existence and character of the Republic and over the identity of France. The anti dreyfusars were vehemently embattled not only with the Jews, but with the Republic and democracy as well. This notion that there was more than one idea of France in play sometimes slips from view in Proust among the nations. Jacqueline reads Gustav Kahn's essay, The Nationalist Idea, as an attack on the very concept of nationhood. But more characteristically, perhaps, what was at stake was not the idea of the nation, but what sort of nation France should be. Thus, Clemenceau contrasts the idea of national defense, the army as the embodiment of the nation, to ideas of liberty and social justice, everything he says, which had given France her glory and renown. The case for Dreyfus was made in terms of universal humanitarian values, but more troublingly, perhaps, it was also made in terms of national values. But it was a difference between a nation that could conceive itself containing Jews and one that could not do so. Jacqueline rightly observes, at the heart of this anti-Semitism, one belief stands out from all the rest, the conviction that the, Jews, that the Jew was not a Frenchman. Jacqueline approvingly quotes Arendt that in the Republic, the Jew had gone from pariah to parvenu overnight. If this were the case, the Jew's loyalty to the Republic appears as a sort of false consciousness. But this, I think, is too one-sided and leaves out of the account not only how there was more than one imagination of France, but also how Jews were deeply integrated in the Republic, and finally and crucially, how the Republic came both to the defense of Dreyfus and won out. After the revolution that gave them equality as citizens, many Jews in France had hoped for integration in the state according to meritocratic criteria. And this led to acute disappointment in the first half of the 19th century. Few Jews could enlist in the army or the prefectorial administration without converting. Catholicism remained the state religion under both uh, the restored Bourbon monarchy and its Orleanist successor down to 1848. However, from the Second Empire and above all in the Third Republic, this changed as Jews rose within the state. Indeed, from the 1870s, French Jews linked their fate to that of the secular state. On the centennial of the revolution, Chief Rabbi Zadok Khan preached that the revolution was our exodus from Egypt, our modern Passover. For a Republican such as Gambetta, Jews were eminently welcome, not least as allies against the Catholic Church. If there is a clerical problem, he said, neither the Protestants nor the Jews have anything to do with it. The conflict is stirred up only by the agents of ultramontanism. And Gambetta pr promoted the careers of a number of Jews, not least that of Joseph Reinach, who became a central figure in the Dreyfus Affair. 
Indeed, between 1870 and 1936, and this is where you hear the real historian speaking, 52 Jews were among the deputies, senators, and ministers in France. Six Jews served as Minister of the Interior in this period. Between 1870 and 1940, there were 50 Jewish prefects and under-prefects in France, and Jews reached the higher reaches of the army and the judiciary too. Crucially, in order to reach these heights, barely any of these Jews felt bound to convert to Christianity, even as they retreated from orthodoxy, and most married endogenously. Of the 52 politicians mentioned, only three married Catholic women. So the entry of Jews into French civil society was expressed by the linkage between Jews and a strongly elaborated state structure and one that did not demand apostasy. What I've done here is to deal with some of the issues raised by the Dreyfus Affair and indeed by Jacqueline's rereading of it, but have done so in terms not of the politics of writing, which Jacqueline illumines, but in terms of the politics of citizenship. Specifically, the question of how to accommodate religious and ethnic difference within a single polity through a single equal and secular conception of citizenship. All of which is to say that Jewish integration in the Republic was contested throughout but it was far from a hopeless quest. In the early years of the last century, the Jews and their allies were winning. It was, I would suggest, a vindication of the diaspora, not the opposite. And this has resonances if we turn to the politics of Palestine and Israel, both as it is now and, how, and as it might be in the future. If we look at Israel, certainly this is the case. As Jacqueline tells us, Partition can never ultimately succeed. We are all failed ethnic cleansers of our uh, we are all failed ethnic cleansers of our own souls, she writes. More prosaically, partition and expulsion in 1948 did not succeed. If the goal in Israel was to produce a homogenous Jewish state, it failed. Israel's population in 1948 stood at 712,000, more than 20% of whom were Arabs, 150,000, and a similar percentage holds today. While Israel oscillates between civic, ethnic, and religious conceptions of citizenship, leaving the non-Jewish population both unequal and, at times, equal citizens. Whether we conceive the future of Israel and Palestine as of, one st as of two states or one state, it is clear that the problem of reconciling diversity and citizenship will remain. In this light, a Jewish history in, in the diaspora might in some respects, and not least in the, Third in the Third Republic, assume a new and urgent relevance. It may yet be that it is not Zionism that holds the answer to the problems of the Jewish diaspora, but that the diaspora may offer some clues for the future of Israelis and Palestinians in the Middle East. One of those ghastly moments <laughs> where you think, why didn't I ask them to send me their papers? <laughs> for this discussion. Um, however, um, having said that, I will just want to start by thanking David enormously for organizing this event, which I think is a great honor. And um, I really am quite, I mean, quite thrilled to be on a platform with these three people, Ingrid, who was a colleague and a friend, and also Brian, likewise. I never saw him. I never saw myself as his teacher, actually, although I do take the credit for giving him his first job. And I'll never forget um, him saying in his interview that in another interview, somebody had leant forward and said, correct me if I'm wrong, Brian, don't you think your subject is a little bit esoteric and specialist for the literary <laughs> academy? It was only like the history. It was worse than that. He says, don't, don't you think writing on Jews is rather narrow? Oh, right. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, Professor of Jewish Studies here on my left, I feel we were, to say the least, vindicated. And actually, I will remember, I'll just tell you this anecdote, but when... Um, Brian had left the room after his interview, and there was one person who'd been rather swayed by this argument that maybe it was all a bit narrow, said, do you think he's going to go anywhere? <laughs> I said, I can assure you 
that he is. <clears throat> anyway, here he is. I mean, this isn't the sign that he's got anywhere, by the way, that he's here this evening, but he certainly has. And Ingrid, who also um, has been teaching me about Proust for a very long time. And I had the great pleasure in preparing for this evening in going back over her remarkable book. This is a plug, uh, Proustian <laughs> Passion. Sorry? Could you speak a little bit? Oh, so sorry. I will try and speak, speak up. Yes, of course. Um, I, I don't know if the microphone it's works. Amplifying. It's not amplifying, it's just recording. Okay, and finally, just to say how thrilled I am to be here under the partial auspices of the Pears Institute for Anti Semitism. I was one of many people who was absolutely thrilled when David Feldman took up this position and has been in constant admiration of the work he's been doing and the kind of intellectual space he's created for a discussion of some of the most difficult issues in relationship to Jewish history and politics of our time. Okay, so that's just uh, by way of introduction. That's a way of postponing what I'm really meant to be talking about. Right? Um, okay, I think all three speakers raise a question. Well, I won't be able to read my... Oh. Can you hear me? No, 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 not a thing. Is this, is this... Should we turn this off now then? Well, how come you can hear them? Do they speak much louder than me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's very good on the front row. Okay. Could you stand at the lectern and put your mouth Okay, I'm going to go and stand at the lectern. Sorry. Oh, my goodness. Oh, okay. Okay, so you had none of that great tribute I just paid to all three of the speakers. You got the gist. You still got the general idea. All right. Um, I can you hear me now? Yes. I'm sorry for that. I'm sorry I didn't pick it up sooner. Um, I feel that all three of them have presented me with a question, which is also a kind of dichotomy, and is partly a challenge and is partly an exposing of a dilemma in thinking about the questions I try to raise in this book. So I'm going to go through them one by one, but I hope that on the way um, I'll pick up what are fundamental connections between what, what they all said. And I'll leave aside for a moment their immense generosity in relationship to the book, which I really do enormously appreciate. Um, when Ingrid said, uh, Proust is an anti-Semite, I, of course, started to quiver in my boots and thought, I got that completely wrong then, didn't I? Um, and I sat there with increasing discomfort, I must say, but of a semi-pleasurable kind, as she simply took to pieces in the way that she has access to the French original of Proust language, which is something that I've always learned from her. She took to pieces the kind of migrations and permutations of the narrator and by implication, Marcel Proust himself, in relationship to the question of Jewishness as a problem of identity. Okay. Um, and it seemed to me that what she displayed, or what she performed, was the fact that every time you think you know where Proust is on this question, he'll make another move that makes you fundamentally uncertain about whether you had it right, and whether, in fact, anybody can ever get it right. So my first response when she was describing the moments at the Princesse de Guermantes, when the prince discovers that a mass has already been said for Dreyfus, or been requested to be said for Dreyfus by someone else, and discovers that it is his wife, <coughs> is for me one of the most moving moments in the whole of A La Recherche, because I think the prince de Guermantes drags Swan to the end. The, the narrator watches, the, tell me if I'm right, Ingrid, watches the Prince de Guermantes drag Swan to the end of the garden as if with a suction pump. And everybody assumes that Swan is about to be expelled from the evening. Even though he's dying, he's going to be expelled because he was a Jew. And what uh, Ingrid didn't concentrate on so much is the kind of really appalling statements that are made about Charles Swann as a Jew, as a Dreyfusard, in the moment when he is effectively dying. And I think Proust makes this extraordinarily uh, intimate relationship between the dying Jew and the hatred of the aristocratic salon. So for me, when she was describing that moment, I thought what we were being given was a moment where 
you simply as a reader have to lay down your arms at the revelation that out of the heart of prejudice can come such a conversion, if you'll let me use that word, to a humanitarian ethic, if I can use that word after what Brian said, and I'll get to that in a minute. Um, so for me, it was a moment of revelation of the best kind. Well, of course, she didn't let us stay there and took to pieces the narrator's position, which throws us back on the question of how Proust is directing us to think about the Jew. I found myself wanting to say, but wait a minute. He does say that Proust, that Swan becomes a kind of physically repulsive caricature of his ancestors. But he also says that he becomes an embodiment of the way of the prophet. And that in this physical disaggregation and disintegration, you see the legacy of a Jewish history, which up to that point, Swan himself had not been able to bear to recognize in himself. And for me, that is one of those moments where Proust is sort of reproaching himself for having written a book where, and I would say, and Ingrid might disagree, as a Jew and a homosexual, he writes himself into the place of a narrator who is neither a heterosexual, neither a homosexual, nor a Jew. Okay, so I found myself wanting to say, wait a minute, but there are all these other moments. But the more Ingrid continued on her path, the more I realized that I was falling into a trap that she was asking me to fall into, and in a way asking us all to fall right in, which was to justify. And again, if I can plug her book, it is the most extraordinary analysis of the whole process of self-justification in Proust, and therefore how every move he makes, again, I'll say ethically, is undermined by a kind of defensive commentary on what it means to take up those positions and a kind of a silent sabotage of the uncertainty, the forms of ethical uncertainty, which he also offers to the reader. Okay, so by the end, I was hugely relieved because I realized that what she was saying was that Proust forces us as a reader to enter into the best and the worst of the human soul. And that it is absolutely central to his argument, his position, I'm not quite sure what the right word would be here, is absolutely central to what he is doing, that we are able to entertain the possibilities of us holding the forms of belief that are most repellent to us. Which is to say simply, that anti-Semitism cannot be dismissed from a point of rational superiority. It has to be understood. And there is a crucial moment when he's writing about the Dreyfus trial, which of course he attended as a young man, where he says, I understood, I sat in the courtroom and I understood how the court could turn against Zola, how one could be an anti-Semite. And I take the point of Zola's anti-Semitism in his writing and I realized that I, I was part of what it was that I was also trying to expose. He was a Dreyfusar to the hilt. He was central in the organization of the manifesto and petition in support of Zola's famous letter, J'accuse. But he wouldn't be Proust, of course, if he didn't realize that to take up that kind of fixity of position, this leads to, I think, Brian's um, brilliant and important critique of the book. To take, up that kind of to take up that kind of position, you have to know your complicity with the other side. Otherwise, you have simply passed a judgment that cannot take any track, will have no traction in the world. Okay, so um, I just want to say that um, when Ingrid ended by talking about us all being caught in the play of narcissism, I felt in a way you were saying that that's perhaps where Proust's politics reside in the self-accusatory moment, which shows us that none of us are free of the identity part of identity politics, and that we all occupy it defensively, one way or another, however much we might try to rid ourselves of it. Okay, let me now pass to Brian. Um, and I can only say how overwhelmed and embarrassed I was um, to be put well, I was turned into a daughter of Hannah Arendt, and that for me is a huge fellow I can pack up now and never write another word. I mean, I thought that was just fantastic, and I was I made me very happy. I was just, you know what I would say, made me incredibly pleased. Although, of course, he was very careful to say that there are huge areas of difference, and he located the most important one in relationship to Freud. 
I should say I've been recently working on Erin, so you're absolutely right, Brian, that she's become more and more of a preoccupation of mine, and it goes back and forwards in my writing. And I use the wonderful quote about she's going to get no prizes for understanding of Freud. Interestingly, she accepted the Sigmund Freud Prize, despite that. <laughs> oh, and interestingly, Elizabeth Young Brule, whose biography is indeed the definitive biography of Hannah Arendt, her next book was a biography of Anna Freud. And Elizabeth Young Brule went on to become a psychoanalyst. Um, so I think there are more connections here than meet the eye. And in fact, I would argue that Hannah Arendt's analysis of prejudice and the perils of prejudice and the viciousness of it and her remarks in The Origins of Totalitarianism about how prejudice is a response to the dark fact of mere difference and a kind of fear in the heart about what it means <coughs> precisely under an emancipatory regime or a democratic regime for everyone to have the right to be different. Um, it seems to me that in moments like that she is brushing against a potentially psychoanalytic vocabulary about uh, revulsion towards another who one needs mentally to control and expel at one and the same time. Let me come to the point of Brian Chayette's um, critique where he suggests that there is a tension in Proust among the nations between a political ethics which requires or is sure about the grounds for justice and a form of un ethical uncertainty which unsettles any such judgment. Of course, this is so much chapter two of what Ingrid was talking about. Um, I see them as inseparable. I mean, I would try and make the case for them being inseparable. Before I do that, however, I, w I was remembering when I was listening to Brian a wonderful paper that the philosopher Akhil Bilgrami at Columbia University gave in a conference in tribute to Edward Said, where he argued that there was a real tension between Said's struggle for justice in relationship to the Palestinian and his commitment to modernity and to modernist experimental form or troubling of form in modernist writing and specifically in music. So I think he was saying something rather similar to what Brian was saying in relationship to me. That's not to make another unjustified comparison. Arendt is quite enough without me throwing myself in the same room, as it were, intellectual, uh, as Edward Said. However, it did make me think of that as a real problem. Let me say why I think they're, however, inseparable. And that is because if you take someone like Bernard Lazar, in what for me was one of his most resonant statements where he says, for a Jew, Jewish nationalism is nothing else than the struggle for freedom and is the right for a man to feel able to stand up in the sun. And it's an all-inclusive, universalist concept of nationalism, if there can be such a thing. It's lifted straight out of the Dreyfus affair, or at least I argue that it is because after Dreyfus had been on the island for a couple of years, the guards built palisades all around his enclosure so that he literally could not see the sea and could not see the sun. So there's something about the, the blackness of what was physically done to Dreyfus and Lazar's statement about the man's right to freedom to stand up in the sun, which made me think that he was lifting his concept of nationalism right out of the purgatory of Dreyfus. In so doing, insofar as I understand it, Lazar is ta asking for a non-exclusive, non-territorial form of national identity, which is to say he is arguing against the values of militarism, nationalism, and racism, which came to characterize the French definition of the nation state at the expense, and I would repeat this despite um, David Feldman's important reservations of the Jew. So I, and also I want to turn here to La Revue Blanche, which plays an important part in one of the chapters of Proust Among the Nations, which was an extraordinary journal, which I knew nothing about until I started researching Dreyfus, who having been a bit ambiguous politically, sort of anarchic, semi-leftish, really found its voice at the time of Dreyfus and published article upon article criticizing uh, the, the anti-Dreyfusard and above all criticizing the militarism, 
the exclusivism and the racial ideal of racial purity being promoted by the anti-Semites of the Dreyfus affair. And in particular, they take issue with Maurice Barrez, who was one of the an important sort of uh, anti-Dreyfusar for the concept of blood that he promotes as the grounds for his hatred of Dreyfus. Of course, this was a mixed blessing because the fact that Dreyfus was a Jew meant that for someone like Baron Charlus, who Ingrid spoke about so evocatively, he wasn't a traitor. I mean, Dreyfus was not a traitor because he wasn't a Frenchman. So how could he be a traitor? I mean, so let's talk about giving with one hand and taking back with another. And as I always like to tell at this point, um, um, I found myself in a restaurant in France a few years ago and found myself sitting next to the grandson of Charles de Gaulle. Uh, it was on the eve of Sarkozy's election and I foolishly asked him what he thought and he said, um, Je m'excuse pas d'être raciste. Is it? <laughs> it's fine to be a racist, he said. Sarkozy must win because then France will become French again. And my partner sitting next to me sort of nudged me as if to say, now don't ask the question I know you're going to ask. <laughs> don't ask it because I did. And I said, okay, what about the Jews? <laughs> and he said, it's not a problem. The Jews don't threaten the identity of France because they're not French. <laughs> so this has not gone away. This has not gone away. So anyway, I think the point I'm trying to make here is that the struggle for justice, i.e. for a non for a non-anti-Semitic, non-racist, am I running out of time? I've got two more minutes. Ah, I haven't even got to it yet. Um, um, and the concept of a form of uncertainty where you would not capitalize <coughs> on forms of self-knowledge which are exclusive of the other. For me, despite what Brian said, they're inseparable. Let me just say one quick thing about uh, Amir Mufti, which is we read it, I think we read him differently, because although I agree that there is this uh, sliding between India and the Middle East, I think it is absolutely central to Amir Mufti's argument as I understand it, that it is the partition of Europe in relationship to the Jews that make possible the founding lines of partition in India, Pakistan, and in Israel, Palestine, which of course happen at the same moment, which is to say that it is a European logic of partition which transposes itself um, across to Britain's former colonies. So I think it's a slightly more historically precise argument um, than might appear. Now, in relationship to David um, Feldman's critique, it's just confirmed to me that, you know, I always have a hidden superego, which is called a historian. <laughs> and here it was, uh, or here he was. Um, um, and I was absolutely intrigued when he said that I'm indebted to the Zionist account of the status of the Jew in Europe. And I think I have to make a kind of confession here, which is I think there are, the reason for that is because as he rightly said, there have been such attacks on my work on Zionism that I am in ways which I'm really gonna have to think about again tending to lean over backwards to say, yes, I can see the argument because of Dreyfus, therefore Israel. Yes, I can see the argument that after Dreyfus, the position of the Jew in some sense became untenable. I would want to counter his account of the rise of the Jews and their assimilation and their successful participation in French society. Or I would want to suggest that we need to counter that attack with the absolute virulence of the anti-Semitism that was provoked by the Dreyfus affair, right? So I don't think the one is an answer to the other. I don't think you can say, because they're all, and Léon Blum was a Jew, he went on to become Prime Minister of France. He, of course, was very critical of other Jews who did not speak out in support of Dreyfus. So I don't think the one, dis the one reality dispenses with the other. But I did think when he was talking about this, that um, maybe I'm too busy trying to placate my critics in order to be able to say what I hope is still the outrageous things I go on to say. Right? <laughs> I think that's called having your cake and eating. <laughs> All right, uh, just finally then to say that um, I totally accept David's account of the debate about what sort of nation France should be. I think it relates back to Brian Chayette's point about what is the nature of a political critique. 
Um, and I would also want to totally accept that the question is open. And in a way, I feel that if Bernard Lazar is one of the heroes of this book, it's because he offers back and forwards to Jewish identity or to Israel, which is why he's so important. It's why Hannah Arendt writes her essay, Theodore Herzl or Bernard Lazar. He offers a counter image of what another form of nationalism should be, which becomes in his hands a diasporic form of identity. So I just want to end by saying that in a way, the whole drift of the book, which is an attempt to put Europe, make Europe take responsibility for what's happening in Israel-Palestine today, but also to ask Israel-Palestine to look back at what happened at Dreyfus and to see precisely the different ways it could have gone if other voices had been listened to. Okay, so uh, all I can repeat is my really profound thanks to you all for what you've elicited out of my book. Thank you very much.